you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Patrick Jones, co-author of the book, The Art of Free Travel, A Frugal Family Adventure. Patrick and his partner, Meg Ullman, are artists, writers, and videographers who live on a permaculture plot in Dalesford, and I hope I pronounced that right, Patrick, Australia. And Patrick and Meg and family just went on an amazing journey. Um, And I just want to welcome you to Sustainable World Radio first, Patrick, and I can't wait to talk about your trip and everything you learned on that trip, or a few things you learned on that trip. I'm sure you learned a lot. Oh, thanks so much, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. And so, Patrick, you and your family embarked on a 14-month adventure, riding your bikes along the east coast of Australia. Can you tell our listeners a bit about the route you took and the total number of kilometers that you um, rode on your bikes? It's it's really incredible. Sure. We set out from our um, home in Dalesford, you, you pronounced it absolutely correctly, in southern um, Victoria or southern uh, east and eastern Australia. So that's just above Melbourne, really. And we headed inland for the first thousand k's up over the high country, the snowy mountains and the blue mountains, et cetera, et cetera. And just above Sydney, we got onto the coast and then just crawled very slowly up coast roads, big highways, little roads bush roads we followed google bike a few times and ended up on no roads at all but in paddocks Uh, and slowly and surely we got up to almost the tip of australia Uh, our most northern part was a little aboriginal community town called hopevale um, of the uh, yugu imager people and we were guests uh, of the elders tim and, and elaine mcgreen there and that was such a highlight But the reason why we went so slowly is that we wanted to record all the freely available forageable plants, mainly plants, some mushrooms, and um, we certainly snared rabbits and caught fish as well, but mainly mainly plants along the way that that are are either indigenous, so traditional bush tuckers, or newly newcomer species, you know, otherwise called weeds. And of which there are are many. And so that was kind of the purpose of the trip, to go as a family, to travel slowly, to have like a a year-long, at least, it ended up being 14 months, um, a year-long treasure hunt uh, for all the different free foods we could find along the way. You know, it's really an incredible journey. And listeners should know that it wasn't just you and Meg on your journey. Can you tell us who um, came along for the ride? We left with our 14-month-old baby, Woody, who grew up on the bike. We also had our 11-year-old, Zeph, who turned 12 on the, on the trip, and our little Jack Russell, Zero, who, who was our chief rabbiter and biological GPS. You went on this 400-day journey. What led you to embark on this besides wanting to document the, the free food and foraged food and mushrooms that you might find along the way? Well, I, I just finished writing my doctorate um, on walking for food, which was really around remodeling economies, uh, localized food and energy resource economies. We were a bit sort of burnt out and um, we hadn't traveled for years, so it was time to, to, to move. But apart from documenting the edible wild plants in Australia, we we really wanted to see how you could apply permaculture to traveling, to mobility. I mean, permaculture, as many of your listeners will know, is based around settlements or settled locations. And so, you know, what happens when permaculturalists want to travel or people who are using permaculture principles want to get mobile? That was kind of the bigger project, I suppose. Like, how does a family move with a very low carbon 
footprint or to use David Holmgren's uh, sixth principle, produce no waste. How do we, how do we travel? I mean, when, when we leave our permaculture community and our little quarter acre plot um, where we um, are pretty, there's almost no packaging in our food. Our food miles are, are sort of measured in meters. A lot of our resources are walked for. How, how do we then apply that to the road? So, Patrick, I often ask my guests what their definition of permaculture is. Could you share that with our listeners? Sure. I mean, I, I'm borrowing from uh, an American permaculturalist who I can't think of his name, but I, I, I really liked his short answer, which was applied ecology. It's, it's the application, the everyday and economic application of, of principles that are embedded in ecological systems or ecological uh, intelligences. So how we learn from other, from the communities of life that are other than human and how we as humans interact with, with those communities and be part of the living worlds of the world. That's probably the long-winded version. That was, that's great. It's very, very nice. And I love applied ecology. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, I, I, that's just that's that's in a nutshell because permaculturists often, I think, get um, <laughs> criticised for saying, "Well, it's all a bit wiffy waffy, wishy washy." You know, you know, what is it in? You know, what is it in seven, seven words? Light <laughs> well, <I had> ecology. <laughs> Did you have anything you wanted to mention about permaculture and applying permaculture principles to your travel? I have written an article in. Pip magazine, which is the Australian permaculture magazine, uh, Meg and I wrote, co-wrote an article about applying permaculture principles to our trip. Um, and if people want to get a hold of that, they can contact Pip magazine Australia. But I mean that that just basically goes through David Holmgren's uh, twelve permaculture principles, and all but one we we applied. The the one that that um, I, f- I forget exactly how it goes, but it's it's about. It's it's specifically about designing patterns. Um, you know, I, we couldn't really apply that one, but every other principle we could apply to our our, tri- our trip. And and David Hongren is a is a good friend of ours. He's a community friend. He lives just a, a well a six and a half minute bike ride from our place. And so we're lucky to have him and his partner Sue Dennett uh, in our community. And um, he's been a, a great sort of. Well, Sue and David have been just wonderful elders in our community. That's had a big impact on me. I mean, I didn't even know about permaculture when I came to this area 20 years ago. And and then to sort of wake up and fall in love with permaculture and then realize that a community neighbor is um, is, is David. It, it's been it's been a great privilege for, for Meg and I to get to know those guys. One thing that I loved um, the idea of was not only the low carbon travel, taking permaculture on the road, um, and living your ideal deals as you travel. Can you tell us a bit about the art of slow travel? What was it like to really take your time and move slowly through this very fast-paced world? Yeah, that was a big part of it. It was part of the ethic and even politic of of the journey. When you move slowly, you see maybe 10, maybe 20 times more roadkill on the roads. You know, in Australian roads, it, they're just littered with flattened fauna, for want of a better word. You know, when you're traveling slow, you're smelling the immense um, shock and trauma of what fast mobility constructs, I suppose. And and you're, you're very aware of it because you're also one of those vulnerable mammals that could get in the, <laughs> get in the road of a, of a truck or a texting pea plater. Pea plating is like a sort of provisional license in Australia. Um, an in, inexperienced driver texting on their phone. And, you know, you're very aware that, you know, a split second. Uh, it's very dangerous also riding in Australia. The, the shoulders which cyclists have um, can be very generous. They can be two metres and then all of a sudden disappear to nothing. And you're on the roads with very aggressive drivers who will be very kind when there's a, is a big wide shoulder, but um, it's something quite, quite other when, when, the, when the shoulder disappears. We were in this sort of remarkable juxtaposition between slow mobility and really when it was quiet and when there was little traffic on the roads and we could find even even some of the old rail trails that we went on 
it was really just about the slow mobility, whereas when we were on the busier roads, it was about that intersection between what we were trying to establish and what, I guess, the dominant culture is the dominant culture's imperatives. It almost put you more in a level playing field with the other animals. Exactly, exactly. And we became very attuned to eating the waste or the interrupted life, that that if we could somehow embody that interrupted life, the roadkill along the way, that um, not that it happened that often because it, well, most of the animals were wasted before we got we, you know, we, we could butcher them, but occasionally we would. And it, it just felt right to embody that, that meat and that become our energy for, for, for the, the mobility that we were choosing. One thing I noticed on your blog and website is that you really are, are not into the disposable lifestyle and really wanted to use waste. So that's really embodying one of the permaculture principles about waste is taking advantage of the plants around, not only the plants around you, but the roadkill, the animals that otherwise would go to waste. Yeah. And even, even feral animals uh, in Australia that are poisoned or shot en masse um, and often paraded in a public setting like the hundreds of foxes are strung up shot and strung up along um, fence lines mm. um, and of course foxes and feral cats are seen as number one enemy like weeds and they have to be poisoned with the you know the latest technology chemicals and that kind of relationship to, to the land is, you know, is, is very simplistic and monocultural in its approach. So one of the things that I guess, you know, has become an ethic slash politic of, of our households, and certainly broader, there's a lot of Australians thinking like this, that if, if an animal is uh, like a feral animal that is going to be shot or poisoned is actually rather incorporated into a diet, so that we're mm-hmm. not reliant on agricultural meat, which, I, you know, which, as we all know, is highly unecological, whereas the ethics of an animal living its life outside of captivity, if numbers grow alarmingly, like feral cats and foxes, and they have an impact on, on other animals and other species and the, and the environment, well, then surely, if we are to eat meat, if we've made that choice to eat meat, then these are the meats that we would prefer to uh, have in our diet. It's a very complex issue. Um, and so even though I'm not against farming per se, there are great examples. Indigenous Australians pre-1788 were an agrarian culture. They've only been reported as chancy hunter-gatherers, but they're for political reasons. But the, the new history and, and science that's coming out to demonstrates reciprocal agrarianism across Australia in really sophisticated ways. And these are the locavore economies that our family regard very highly and that I, I guess are trying to model in a modern modern world context. Mm-hmm, which can be hard to do. You left your permaculture plot, so you're already practicing permaculture on the plot, and you were a forager or have been a forager for quite some time. Did it ever was? Did it seem like a daunting task to take your um, partner and two children and your dog on bikes across Australia? Uh, did you ever stop and question and think this is impossible, or did you guys just go for it? Well, when I came up with the idea, I had to persuade Meg. It took a little bit of persuasion, but then when, when she was on board, we were both just so excited about it. So, you know, as an idea it can be extremely exciting in its sort of infancy. But then as we got closer to the leaving date, we both became extremely anxious and nervous and thinking, oh, no, what the hell have we committed to? And um, is this going to go well? We've done a little bit of cycle touring in Australia before for, you know, three days here, four days there. These are dangerous roads. These are not car-friendly roads like they have in Holland and 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 uh, other countries. But anyway, we were committed to it, and we took off with knowing about a hundred species from our bioregion or climate climate zone that we would regularly incorporate into our diet, um, mainly plant species. And so, with that hundred species, we sort of inched bit by bit north and learnt. And, and came back basically after 14 months with 256 species, which we list at the back of our book, both the common and Latin names. 
and so, yeah, that, as, as I said, that, that includes both newcomer species, uh, agricultural weeds and garden escapees, and also traditional bush tuckers uh, of Aboriginal communities. And I want to get back to the plants, and I can't wait to hear about some of these plants in detail, and also traditional um, Australian ways of tending the plants and tending the wild. Um, but first off, did you have a budget for this, and did you end up spending more on the road than you would have if you had stayed home? Um, that's a good question. Yes, we did have a budget. It was about 30 bucks a day, $30 a day, Australian dollars. What we did is we, we have a small um, house here, which we rented out, and that pretty much paid the mortgage on it. And we had a little bit left over. And that was, and we were doing little bits of work along the way, writing articles, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, really, we were trying to enact an, another form of economy. So there was lots of bartering and gift exchange. And that was interesting too, because gifting in your own community with trusted loved ones and neighbors and and community gardeners, et cetera, et cetera, is one thing. But then bartering with strangers is another. And so there was what we found, we thought we were going to be quite isolated, but what we found was an incredible level of trust. We were invited into people's homes to stay with them. And if you know, if it was for a, a few days, they'd say, look, you guys look a bit tired. Do you want to stay another night or two? We'd say, yeah, but only if we can dot, dot, dot. And some of those dot, dot, dots were designing a backyard permaculture garden for them or looking after their kids or, you know, cooking meals or giving uh, foraging or rooster killing workshops. Yeah, just sort of like trading our skills for um, a place to stay for a few days and just to, to chill out. But mostly we gorilla camped or stealth camped. So there are designated free camping sites in Australia. They're sort of based on car travel. Uh, we were traveling much less distances, so we had to kind of make it up ourselves. So what we tried to do is uh, write ahead of time to the Aboriginal communities of the countries that we were moving through. For those listeners who don't know, there's you know hundreds and hundreds of countries in Australia um, indigenous countries and um, to, to contact their cooperatives or elders and to ask permission to pass through their country, country and, and ask if there's anything we can do in return. So Patrick, you um, were already a forager and you were saying earlier one of your goals was to really document the free food along the way and you found um, hundreds of species of free food. Could you share some of these with our listeners in, in a bit of detail. I really was interested in, I think it's called, is it yam daisies? Is that right? Yeah. So yam daisies are a very big part of the indigenous economy that existed in central Victoria, where Dalesford sits, the town that we, we live in. They were farmed um, on often on contour in irrigation channels. And they're a um, little tuber, very uh, similar to a small potato. And they have about uh, according to Dr. Beth Gott from Mon Monash University, have about 10 times the nutrient density of potatoes. And they were a major carbohydrate of the Jarrah people and, and the kind of neighboring countries as well. Yam daisies, they're in, in, in the kind of perennial grasslands of central Victoria, which were deep volcanic or are deep volcanic grasslands, yams were just a very significant part of Jarrah people's food source. They really just exist now in marginal forested areas because the, the perennial grass, grasslands of central Victoria have been um, compacted and eroded by sheep mainly and other forms of farming. Mm -hmm. So these, the soils that point of contact explorers came across were spongy and aerated and um, light and you know within a few years thousands and thousands and thousands of sheep moved on to that land and so the yams were pretty much gone that economy was uh, destroyed very quickly well, i think the, the yams are an interesting plant because the the picture of what point of contact explorers saw in terms of aboriginal economy and what the pioneers three or four years later following the explorers saw was two different economies. 
because the yams went, the farming went, the, even and the wheat belt went further up in the north, the wheat, the indigenous wheat belt. Basically, the the people that moved onto the land and dispossessed uh, the indigenous communities um, very quickly just saw hunter ga- chancy hunter gathering, and and it also suited the political ambitions of England at the time to say to use the Latin term terra nullius, which means empty land. There's no one of any significance here. Whereas if they had actually seen agriculture, if they'd seen the agrarian communities that the explorers have written down and seen, that would have meant that England would have had to use another type of language. I think there were three, England would use either invasion, treaty, or terra nullius when they took over lands. So they chose t- Terra Nullius, which was just, is just the great lie of Australia. So yam daisy farming, which is documented in drawings and early point of contact descriptions from Europeans, yeah, really kind of central to what I, I call ecologically intelligent economies that, that existed from where we live now. So even though we um, are trying to grow yams in our, in our community gardens and our gardens and that knowledge is returning, there are also other things that have come here, such as dandelions, such as plantain, that are much more global plants. But still, can, we can still have a similar sort of relationship in terms of cultivating them and using them in low-impact economies, local economies. You know, that is just fascinating about um, Aboriginal farming and tending the land. And it sounds like it was tended in a much more um, respectful relationship with nature. Can you share with us anything else you want to share about Aboriginal land tending? And then I'd love to hear about some more plants in specific. Sure. There there is a remarkable book that came out uh, in Australia in 2014 called Dark Emu. Um, written by an Indigenous scholar called Bruce Pascoe. And on our recent book tour, we dropped in to see Bruce at his home where he is cultivating yam daisy seeds, and he he gave us some for our community gardens. But his work, Dark Emu, is sort of leading this new scholarly era, really, in in rewriting Australian history. If if any listeners are interested, I I urge them to, to find a copy of Dark Emu. Yeah, so in terms of plants, really, I guess the, the pharmacopoeia of food medicine plants that have come from Europe and Asia and Africa are probably, and, you know, have, you know are what I suppose are called weeds or um, invasive species, are the plants that we have really, our family has really identified with, partly because some of them are from our own indigenous or peasant uh, ancestry. They are the food medicine plants that our, our ancestors incorporated into their diets. As I said before, the things like mallow and plantain and dandelion and hawk's beard and cat's weed, these are, are all wonderful plants that we, we tend to, to, to utilise them in a very simple way on the road um, and even at home where we cook up, especially the bitters, the, the wild bitter greens, boil them up, squeeze out the water after we've boiled them for about five to ten minutes and then put them on a chopping board, cut across them quite rigorously with a sharp knife, drizzle olive oil, sprinkle salt and lemon juice and you have pretty much a Greek peasant horta dish. And I think this dish is, is, you know, is used around the world. But that Greek horta dish is so, you can do so many things with it. It's such an amazing way of getting a whole lot of vitamins and minerals directly hand-picked, that haven't been stored for long periods of time, that are otherwise sprayed or hated or loathed by local councils or, you know, lots of other forms of land manage- management, uh, they're free. You know, th- these great foods um, haven't travelled great distances. They, they, they travel themselves. They plant themselves. They water themselves. So they, they don't need fertilisers. They just arrive where you are. And I think this is the the important part of our story is enacting ecological economies, knowledge of the land and of plants and animals and fungi are just is so essential. 
But our school, our modern schooling teaches us everything but that, unless we're going to specialise in botany. And even then, we're not looking at plants necessarily from an economic perspective, or is certainly a home economic perspective. I think a big part of it, of, of our travels, but also our, our life generally, is to, to impart to our kids and their friends and our, and our neighbours just how simple, with the, with the knowledge, just how simple it is to enact a very healthy and very low-carbon uh, food economy. Even if weeds and feral animals are only 5 to 10, maybe 15% of our diet, depending on the season, that's 5 to 10 to 15% that we're not growing large-scale industrial agriculture, that we're actually mitigating, we're going, we're going backwards. And, of course, large-scale industrial agriculture grows populations and populations grows large-scale agriculture. And it's just this unstoppable, basically deforesting machine that, that's created by an economics of disregard or extractive economics. Um, to incorporate foraging, even if it's a small part, where actually that small percentage is not participating in that bigger economy. It's actually sending it into degrowth. By foraging and, and by eating such fresh food, how did you feel energetically and uh, physically, mentally um, on the road? We, we felt great most of the time, like incredibly vibrant. Sometimes we would just do too many kilometers and need to rest and feel just physically tired. But, but it was the times, if I could flip that question, it was the times where we, we had hardly anything to forage and there were just ro- truck stops. And we found ourselves eating really crap fast food. That's when we really noticed just how, you know, poor energy in means poor energy out and we really kind of suffered on the bikes we, it was you know fast and sugary that would sort of spike our energy levels up and then we'd crash down can you share with us one of your favorite meals on the road and maybe i'm, I'm also curious about some of the fruit that you would find we, there was there was a there was one camp just uh north of mission beach in far north queensland where we stayed for a week and we had fresh water coming onto the beach um to drink from we had uh, a jetty just down the way a bit where I would catch really beautiful ocean fish. We had coconuts um, that had either fallen off and, or fresh up in the trees and, and some of the trees were on such a lean that we could actually jemmy ourselves up there and, and, and cut off some fresh coconuts. We had a thing called snakeweed, which is a really great medicinal tea that we drank on the billy and a whole pharmacopoeia of um agricultural weeds and so that was that was one week where we were almost completely just living off the land there was an abundance of food and it wasn't necessarily a particular recipe but it just felt so fantastic that most of the time we were on the road it was between five and fifteen percent that we were getting from the land but you know there were times where we were a hundred percent and just not needing to go to a shop and buy our food um, when we were on the road it was just fantastic. And that was, you know, very much like how we live back home. This shop, shop bought food is only about 10% of our, maybe 15% of our food. So, you know, and there is being a traveler, there is a thing of, well, what are you putting back if you're just taking, you know, we were also highly aware of that. What were we doing to replenish fish stocks? What were we doing to replenish the, the fruits and, and plants that we picked? I think that's why, you know, I mean, coconuts are a weed in far north Queensland. Mangoes and bananas are a weed in, in far north Queensland. And then there's all the bush fruits, such as the burdekin plum, which were in abundance and up, getting up into the rainforest fruits, of which they are just abundant fruits. So I think just travelling lightly and not polluting, not creating uh, lead and PCBs and dioxin and detergents, polluting detergents that come from cars and go into river systems. By, by, by travelling with as little pollution output and, uh, and as gently as possible is a kind of regenerative economy because your impact is much lighter. Also, I think the weed and feral, like concentrating on weed and feral cultures meant that we're kind of biologically 
harvesting what is getting sprayed or what is seen as, as, as a problem, problem plant or animal anyway. So even though we were really interested in bush tuckers, we also were mindful too that there was certain traditional Aboriginal foods that really we had no rights to harvest or to gather um, that were, you know, protected um, for environmental or cultural reasons. And so um, we, 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 did, we certainly documented them as foods, but we, we didn't feel that we could, um, we could collect that food. Mm-hmm. One thing too that I um, I think I either saw it in one of your videos or read about it was that you also um, partook of insects occasionally, and I'm just curious what green ants and the wit is it witchetty grubs what do they taste like and how was that? Well, we we didn't actually find any witchetty grubs where we were, but green ants were in abundance in northern Queensland, and they're incredibly delicious. They often grow on citrus trees and they have a citrus taste and they're used traditionally in Aboriginal communities as as like a a vitamin C boost or an immune boost or um, when people have colds and flus, they would, you know, a whole lot of green ants would be sort of mashed up and into a kind of um, tablet, if you like. They're also used in spears and uh, woomeras um, were being made out of ironwood, which is have splinters that can be quite toxic to the skin. If the if the men were making spear throwers, they would get a paste of green ants and uh, rub it into their skin before they started shaping with that wood to stop infection. So they're really a remarkable, again, an, an abundant species. So yeah, bloodwood apples were a parasitic grub uh, and they're larvae that create these little almost wooden-like balls on on eucalypts or bloodwood apples is a type of gum tree they were absolutely delicious so they were cut in half these hard hard balls and then you scrape out the lovely soft center and the insect itself quite sweet almost like a sort of a starchy uh sweet starchy taste we had things like mud whelks which are a conical um shellfish um eugeries or pippies in parts of Queensland, um, a daily uh, pleasure. There was there were so many things. Are there any other plants that you discovered during your journey that you would like to share with listeners? Yeah, so there were things like peanut tree or the monkey nut tree that we found on Palm Island, um, and also tropical almonds, and they were beautiful fruits or nuts, really that we'd never had before. Their traditional bush tuckers that region. We would come across things like goita cola, incredibly powerful herb that's you know globalized. I think comes from the east. That was you know little uh, carpets of goita cola would appear everywhere in people's gardens and also in in forest environments. Pig face and purslane were rich, salty plants, succulent. I should say succulent, salty plants that grew along the coastlines. Pig face, it would uh, give up these beautiful little f- figs that tasted like salty, sweet figs, or, f- or fruits, I should say, that tasted like salty, sweet figs. And purslane is a, a plant that's high in omega-3 that is, is a, basically a weed that, that um, grows in abundance. I want to go hiking with you. <laughs> I think it would be great. You would never go hungry. It would be like all these edible things around us that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, a lot of a lot of these plants, because of the globalized nature of the world, especially since industrialization, a lot of these plants have travelled on on ships and planes and people's in people's um, boots and 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 of course traditional ways by wind and and um, and, and bird droppings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. When I'm researching a a plant, I often find it in several countries. And in fact, the snakeweed, when we're up in Hopevale and also in Palm Island, we we found great quantities of it. And these are two Aboriginal communities that suffer from type 2 diabetes and have really high levels because of the because of what Western diet has done in those communities. But snakeweed, when I was researching it, has uses in south parts of south america um to to treat type 2 diabetes i mean one of the things that we were going to do from on this trip with the research is to 
turn our our findings into a book called Free Tucker. But our publisher said, that's a very expensive book with lots of pictures. Um, could you just write the story? It's a fan- fascinating story. We'd really love your memoir of it. So that's how The Art of Free Travel came about. But really, we set out to write a much more sort of ethno-botanical survey, not, not a highly scientific, but certainly a very accessible ethno-botanical survey of free plants and, and fungi in Australia. Could you tell listeners who are listening who don't live in Australia what um, bush tucker is, just in case they don't know? I looked it up after reading it on your website, but can you tell us the definition of that term? Yeah, sure. I mean, bush tucker is really any uh, traditional Aboriginal food, but uh, Aboriginal people have incorporated things like feral cats and foxes, which have only come um, since colonization, uh, camels, wild pigs, and goats. Uh, can also be bush tucker as well. So I guess it's um, any food that is captured in a permaculture sense by Aboriginal people and, and used as part of their economy. And, and what we found um, with our travels and going to Aboriginal communities, those families that were really reliant on the local uh, shop or supermarket were the ones suffering the most from diabetes and heart disease. But those families that were enacting more traditional food economies were far better off, were were much healthier. So the the families that were passing down the knowledges and eating more traditional foods or certainly free foods were were just in a much better way. I, I asked one Torres Strait Islander that we met along the way, what is the you know biggest threat to your culture? And she said, Western food is now the biggest threat. And I think this is quite prevalent of all cultures across the world, really. But, um, yeah, particularly on on those cultures that have been used to a diverse and extremely healthy diet for for so many millennia. Aboriginal culture goes back 60,000 years in the north of Australia and 40,000 in the south. Bruce Pascoe, returning to his book, The Dark Emu, claims he has evidence to suggest or archaeological evidence to suggest that bread making goes back to 18,000 years in Australia. So Aboriginal people, he believes it'll be, it's his thesis at the moment, but he believes it'll be proved that uh, Aboriginal uh, cultures pip the Egyptians uh, by about 10,000 years in terms of bread making. So there's, you know, we're still a very young country that has largely ignored uh, Indigenous economies and Indigenous land intelligence and we've ignored it because there's enormous amount of guilt, cultural guilt, that that, that masks and has, hasn't wanted to, to, to face it, let alone have the ears to listen to it. But things are changing. And, um, and with that change, we have climate change. And a lot of the foods, like the yam daisy, were, you know, low irrigation foods that didn't need the sort of irrigation requirements that, say, potatoes need. Yam daisies need about five times less water. So, I mean, apart Bruce Pascoe's work, Dark Emu, is, is not only redressing history, it's also saying, well, there's actually a context for this. To learn about Indigenous food economies is also to understand how we're going to adapt in a climate-changed uh, uh, future. So you've, you've spoken, um, Patrick, about so many interesting plants and... Um... For listeners who want the Latin names of these plants, I will include them in the written introduction to this interview. So just so people that want those Latin names, you can take a look. So Patrick, um, we're getting close to the end of our interview, but I'm just curious, were there any fungi or mushrooms that you made use of on your trip that you'd want to talk about? Yes, there were. Usually quite common mushrooms like um, slippery jacks, saffron milk caps, Lawyer's wigs, which are a Caprinus species, wood, wood bluets. There's about eight or nine species that we regularly forage and we found on our trip. But fungi knowledge is in Australia is about 100 years behind botany. There's been, there, there are so many species, there are tens of thousands of species that are, that are not even named, let alone uh, understood unlike Europe and other parts of the world where there are deep fungi knowledges, um, fungi is still a, you know, relatively new science. And so it hasn't, yeah, we don't have 
the, the knowledge to, to glean um, like in other parts of the world. There, there are some books on Indigenous applications of fungi. Some Aboriginal communities were terrified of fungi. Others utilised them in their medicine and food. But that, that knowledge is very patchy and scarce. And then there's a whole lot of newcomer species, that, um, which were the, the species I mainly noted then, which have come, come with agriculture and since colonisation. So this, this journey, I believe you were on the road, getting back to your trip for four, 400 days on the road. And would you encourage others to go on a car-free food foraging trip like this, low carbon, permaculturally, um, applying permaculture to travel? Would you encourage others who are listening to do, to do this? Yes, although I think that you, you, know, you would arrive at that decision yourself. If you are really conscious about the food and energy resources that that you use to do anything, you're going to find you're going to find the the appropriate technologies in in order to do that. So, I don't know if I would say yes, go do it. I would just say follow follow your ethics and your accountable uh, ethical f- frameworks. You know, in Australia, it's it's still very dangerous. I mean, we 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 say to people who say, "Gee, you know, you're putting your kids in in the, the line of of danger every day," and you know, we would say to that, "We are trying in that permaculture spirit. We are trying to to make that physical world that we want to see. We want to make those changes. And if governments don't see," families on bikes traveling long distances nothing is going to change the culture is not going to change and so while there may be risks there are also risks putting your 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 children in front of a tv tv and a screen and feeding them junk food Um, i mean that that to me is a greater societal risk and risk to to their to your children's health than being outside living outside and growing up on ecological knowledges where your children will know how to feed themselves, will know how to move um, with, with, without fossil fuels, will know how to, to respond to change and to be resilient. And so while, yes, there are risks and we acknowledge that, I think there's a greater risk of just staying at home and being frightened of the world and bringing your kids up with that fear. Um, Patrick, what would you say was the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges of this journey? Um, I, I would say the response from motorists on the road. Um, we felt a daily anger towards what we were doing, even though that we, as I explained before, we knew what we were doing. We, we were involved in the positive aspect. We were also kind of traumatized on certain days particularly about just the level of aggression shown towards us. Because we were slow moving, we were holding up fast culture. We we at times were, for a few seconds or a, you know five seconds, holding up a string of people very, very, very eager to get to um, their place, and it just seemed disproportionate between what we were doing, you know, the, the the mode of transport we were trying to achieve, and it was to us it was just so obvious, you know, we have a climate change issue. Cars are a big part of that, and yet. There was no kind of well. There was there was definitely encouragement. I shouldn't say that. And and there were very respectful and courteous people. But I would say, around forty to sometimes sixty percent of motorists had absolutely no time or could not could not see why we had chosen to travel like that and did not have any respect for it. And and I think that you know, in one sense, you know, I should say, well, of course, you know, this is the culture we live in. But on the other hand, it was a daily sense of sadness that 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 is what where we've ended up. That this is what technological progress has produced: manic, stressed, anxious, abusive motorists trying to get somewhere very quick. And I think that giving up probably sixty percent of our dependency on the what I call the fossil fuel or um, you know mon- global monetary economy. It's, it's enabled us to be so much more time rich. And so that, that is going to impact with time poverty. And, 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 and on the road, that is where it clearly intersected and sometimes very, 
dangerously. Did time slow for you on your journey? Could you feel it? And was it a visceral thing that time seemed like it slowed down? Yeah, absolutely. And again, a bit like the when we were able to get a bit of junk food um, on the road, those times we, we actually ran out of time to, to ride all the way back home. It's about 4,000 kilometers up to the, to the tip of Cape York. So it's not, we, we rode about 6,000 kilometers in a, in a sort of direct sense, but then we were riding a whole lot more. So I, I would imagine it'd be more like 9,000 kilometers over the 400 days that we actually rode. But it's about 6,000 if you drew, drew a straight line. And when we got back to Cairns, our eldest son, Zef, had decided he wanted to go to high school and that we needed to get back earlier. So we, were, we weren't able to go as slow. So we actually ended up hiring a car for 10 days to get, to get south a bit more and then rode the last 1,000 kilometres home. And being in that car just totally gave us, you know, we felt, a, that our whole trip was undone. B, B, we got an incredible sense of arriving in places with no connection to them. Because we, we haven't had a car for six or seven years now. And occasionally we'll borrow a friend's to pick up something or, you know, about four or five times a year we'll borrow a car. But um, so this hiring of a car for 11 days was a great sadness to us. But it also re- really reminded us what we'd actually experienced on the road, that, that we were arriving in what we call ecological time to places, being winded in or rained on in to, a, to an area, to an environment, to, to smell it as we approached, as I, I talked about smelling roadkill, but we're also smelling the fruits and flowers and the, the grasses and you know, the humidity and how that impacts on, on, on um, vegetation in terms of the senses. Then we're, you know, that 11 days, even though it felt, we felt like failures having to do that, it was 11 days of just really understanding what, how beautiful it was um, to travel by bicycle at that slow pace. And I think, you know, we got sick and we, there were, we used the air conditioner and that kind of made us all, you know, easily and dr- runny noses and, you know, we just felt terrible. <laughs> You know, people say to us, oh, that would have been a nice break. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's like what you said in the beginning of our interview today is just your creaturely selves. I feel like our creaturely selves are under assault, even though modern technology, it's enabling us to do this interview. And yet we're we're moving so quickly that um, I feel like the, the mode of travel you chose, it gave you time to transition into yes. different I've always said I wish that cars hadn't been invented and everyone just walked everywhere and then but everyone says it would take too long to get there and I I think well we wouldn't know that it was too long <laughs> we, exactly. we would just do it it would be the thing you know I think we'd all be in great shape and and more in tune it it, it just gets back to appropriate technology because even though a bike has to be mined and there are parts for, you know rubber and it, it is a, a modern piece of technology the one it compared to say walking, we could never have taken all the stuff for our family with walk. We've tried that. We tried a five day hike to Melbourne. Yeah, carrying a baby and um, you know a teenager's needs. I mean, obviously, Zeph carries stuff himself. But the you know the bicycle is is a really in terms of energy in and energy out. It's incredibly efficient. And then once it's made. Um, Firstly, it can be recycled. All the parts can be easily reassembled. Secondly, if we had, um, you know, if we just stopped manufacturing cars now and just used the, the, you know, the resort, the mined resources of, of cars to to re to to upcycle into bicycles, we'd never have to mine again for to, to make bikes. But bikes are this, you know, the ability to carry an enormous amount of weight for the effort put in. You're still going slow, not slow like Rebecca Solnit says about walking, which is the perfect speed for thinking. And I think, you know, the perfect speed for enacting economies of regard. But um, the bicycle is sort of the next best thing. It does, you can travel up, you know, 15, 20 kilometers an hour if you're fit enough, or you can travel seven or eight kilometers an hour, depending how much your load is. But it, it's a really, a very efficient piece of technology and like Skype is I mean I haven't had to fly 
across the world to have this interview with, with you. We don't, you know, there's so much uh, intellectual conferencing that's happening in a physical sense that could actually happen. Um, and, of course, the internet is, is you know, a part of, the, of it, the, the software and the hardware f- to enact the internet, of course, is part of the, the fossil fuel machine. I, I accept that. But, you know, we're both operating from each other's homes and there's still we can still converse without huge amounts of travel expense. So, Patrick, we're getting to the end of our time together. This has been a really fascinating discussion that I've, we've had. And I'm wondering what, now that you've been home for a while, um, what do you miss most about being on the road? Um, I think the simplicity, living outside, the housework, as I would joke to Meg, and I would scrape in about a minute, scrape the bottom of our tent out with leaves and a little bit of dirt and throw them outside and say, hey, the housework's done. <laughs> you know, just basically, yeah, there were other pressures on the road. It, 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 didn't, it wasn't a pressureless existence. But I think also the intensity, the physical intensity of it is, was wonderful. It was draining. But, and then the social intensity, like just realising that community can be built while travelling. That, that was a great um, discovery for us. We thought we'd be quite isolated. Again, through social media, um, people would contact us through our blog or our Facebook or whatever page and, um, and, uh, and say, hey, come stay. I can see you're coming, coming our way. And so I, I think, you know, sharing stories and narratives was a big part of the thrill for us on the road. Patrick, if you could share with our listeners where people can find your book and also your website. Well, the website, if you just uh, put into your search engine artist as family, you'll come up with our blog. And for all our other social media handles, um, just at artist as family. And our our book is um, available in Australia and New Zealand at the moment only sadly but it is an audio book and an ebook which people can buy anywhere in the world uh, ask your library local library to get it in yeah it's called the art of free travel and it's put out by new south publishing so patrick thank you so much for spending um this time with us today and do you have anything else you'd want to add to um share with listeners today only that Feel free to get in touch with us through our various on, online sites. If, if, you, if you have further questions of us or you want to find out more about um, the type of travel, the, time, the type of economies that we're trying to transition to, and even about permaculture and poetics, which is my kind of area, like how do we create a permaculture poetic in, in, our, in our home lives with our kids as a, as a creative response to change and a narrative-based response to change. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me today. And um, listeners, you can find Patrick and Meg online and look for their book, The Art of Free Travel, A Frugal Family Adventure. Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining me. It's been a pleasure, Jill. Thank you. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. (laughs) 